Um, all right, well, let's get started. So a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Peter Bacchus. I lead the event and data pipeline team at Netflix. Uh, prior to Netflix, I spent time at Uyala, uh, Yahoo, PayPal, uh, worked in a variety of different areas, everything from payments to ad serving, uh, behavioral targeting, uh, real-time real analytics. Uh, my background primarily is distributed systems, large-scale infrastructure. Um, outside of that, I advise several startups, oddly enough, in the data, security, and container space. Uh, so it's a little bit about me. So I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about Keystone. Keystone is our data pipeline at Netflix. It's what we consider uh, a paved path. All applications and services are able to produce and publish events to our pipeline, and then we handle everything from that point down. Essentially, we're responsible for all the heavy lifting so that all the other teams don't have to do it. So instead of you spinning up your own pipeline or writing your own code to do that, my team is responsible for that. What I hope to cover in today's conversation, uh, architecture design principles, uh, some of the trade-offs we had to make and the decisions why, uh, as well as current state of technologies that we're using. Uh, also, uh, I'll throw in there as a bonus some best practices, some pro tips, uh, as I like to call them. So, as I mentioned, uh, my team is responsible for data pipeline. What does that mean? We're responsible for publishing, collecting, processing, aggregating, and moving data at cloud scale. So that's a relatively common term people throw out a lot. So what does it mean to be cloud scale for us? We do 550 billion events a day. At peak, we're at 8.5 million and 21 GB per second. Uh, on average, we are 6.5 million. We push over a petabyte through our pipeline on a daily basis. And we have hundreds of different event types. Now, we started this process for Keystone in Q4 of last year. At that time, we were at 3.5 million a second, 300 billion. Now, as I mentioned, 6.5 million, 550. It's essentially doubled over the last year. Uh, there's actually another talk, if you guys don't care about Kafka, going on from Netflix about cost management. And they should be highlighting the increase in my spend here shortly. So uh, if you guys catch up, it's actually a pretty good, pretty good talk. So I want to take a few minutes and look at how we arrived to where we're at today. Uh, when we first started, our needs were fairly simple. We had applications and services that published events. We wanted to be able to collect those and write them to S3. So our pipeline looked very similar. Uh, we based it on Apache Chukwa, and it served us pretty well for a while. As time went on, we started getting more and more requests for at least once, uh, as well as real time. So we introduced a branch off mainline that T traffic, so about 20% of traffic went through the real time pipe. So we use that, we routed it to Elasticsearch and Druid. Uh, people consume directly off of Kafka as well, applications. So if you look at it though, it adds a lot of complexity to what we were doing. And there's also a lot of duplication and functionality. So original pipeline was best effort. So there was some loss, not a lot, but there was some. Um, it didn't have any persistence. We didn't keep messages. If, if an instance died, those messages went away. So at the beginning of Q4, we sat down as a team and said, how do we simplify this? For two reasons. One, from an operational management perspective, we're essentially managing two pipelines that serve slightly different use cases. The other was, from a complexity on the business side, we had teams coming to us saying, hey, where, which one, where should I send events? Do I send it to Chukwa? Do I send it to Kafka? If you see, you have events going from Chukwa into Kafka. So there's a lot of confusion as far as what people should be doing. So at Q4, we sat down and said, how do we simplify? And this is what we came up with. This is Keystone. If you notice, Chuck was gone. We've essentially flattened our pipeline. So we no longer have multiple paths in. It's fan in, fan out. 
There are some common themes, router, that we had before, but those are also different, and I'll dig down a little bit deeper in those as we go along. There's a couple reasons why we decided to do this. One of them was there's a huge, huge community around Kafka. Majority of folks raised their hand when they said, who's using or looking at Kafka? Um, so it's a very vibrant community. The other, it offered us the durability that we needed as more and more teams were saying, we need at least once. In fact, at this point, we're starting to get teams saying, we want exactly once. And with our previous pipeline, we wouldn't have been able to do that. We could have built it, but we would have been du duplicating functionality that there's an open source project that already did. And so what we decided to do is put our efforts into helping the community, which in turn would help us. Ideally, we don't want to be a snowflake. Everybody talks about some snowflakes are great, they're unique. Except when you're dealing with infrastructure. Like, no one is really that different where you have to bear the burden of going in at it alone. And that was our philosophy, and that's one of the reasons why we decided to, to, to leverage Kafka. So let's take a look at the first part of our infrastructure, the fronting Kafka. What we have here is we've split it into two. We have normal priority and high priority. Normal priority is a majority of our events. We have, a, we have two replicas and 12 hours of retention. On the high priority, we have three replicas and 24 hours of retention. The reason why we have the difference in retention is what risk we're, are we willing to tolerate if there's some downstream event that occurs. The entire intent of our fronting Kafka clusters is to essentially behave as a buffer. Consume all the events that get thrown at you. If something happens with S3 or Elasticsearch or any, anything downstream, we have 12 to 24 hours to reconcile those issues before we start losing data. So let's take a look at instance types. Um, we ended up going with the D2XLs, primarily large disk, uh, large memory, medium network. The one thing that we did notice, so if you guys are looking at them, uh, once you get around 18 MB per second, replication lag starts to show up. The other thing that we had to do when we went with Kafka, so for those who have used Kafka, for those who haven't, Kafka is not necessarily designed to run in cloud. Uh, and that was one of the things that when we were making our decision, how do we do, how, how do we deal, what do we need to do in order to make it more native to cloud? So right now, we don't have an answer. We over-provision. So we over-provision in all regions to handle peak traffic, as well as if we need to evacuate any region, we need, a, we need to be able to sustain that traffic as well. So our current footprint is about 1,500 brokers spread across three regions. And that's the fronting Kafka piece. One of the things that we've done is zone aware replica assignment. So this is currently an internal version that we have. We have a pull request. Uh, I believe we just submitted an architecture doc as well. There's a couple benefits that we got by doing this. Right now, we're in multiple AZs, right? So from an availability perspective, if we lose an AZ, we're still OK. The other is, if we have multiple Kafka instances on one physical host, and that goes away, this also allows us to survive that. One of the added benefits of doing this is around maintenance. Prior to being able to take out AZs at a time, when we did upgrades, we had to do node by node by node. And so now, when we need to do maintenance, any upgrades, we could do it at the AZ level. We take out an AZ, upgrade, throw back in. Next piece is the control plane. So data movement is done by the data plane, and it's managed by the control plane. So if we look at the control and data plane, job manager manages state. Uh, the control plane reconciles from source of truth. For us, that's Kafka and Zookeeper. 
And one of the things we do is we manage trade-offs based on requirements, latency, throughput, resource utilization. Um, the other thing that we have at the control and data plane is we have the ability to auto-scale. So while we don't have that at the Kafka side, one of the things that we wanted to do is at the routing layer, we wanted to be able to auto-scale, and the control plane allows us to do that. So let's take a look at the router. Uh, you notice that I had same image, because I'm not that good at images. Uh, and the previous, the original diagram is this one. Um, so this routing service is slightly different. Um, one of the things that we also discussed at the time, we did have a routing service. However, it didn't do things like checkpointing. And so if we were going to a pipeline that did at least once, having any part of that have loss defeated the purpose. So once again, not wanting to be a snowflake, we took a step back, said, okay, we could either build this or we could look and see what else there is. And so part of our evaluation, we ended up looking at a couple different things for the routing service. We ended up with SAMHSA. SAMHSA works really well with Kafka. Um, and so what it looks like, we're using Docker, SAMHSA, uh, MySQL RDS, and we have checkpointing clusters for Kafka. So if we were playing buzzword bingo, we're really close, we got a couple more. Um, let's dig in a little bit. So the way this functions is each job is its own container, it's an independent container. And it's assigned specific partitions that it's gonna consume from, as well as which sync. You notice we had S3, Elasticsearch, Kafka. So that is configuration that gets passed to it. So the job manager's responsibility is to write optimized static configurations. The infrastructure continuously reconciles definitions. And then we use unique IDs to, mat to assign to nodes in Zookeeper. So this is kind of high level what we do. Simplified state configuration goes in RDS. It gets passed. The other thing that we did with this, um, the ability to auto scale, I mentioned that earlier. So by having each job have partitions assigned to it that, that it consumes from, if we need to scale up on the Kafka side, if we need to add more partitions, then for routing, all we need to do is launch another job and have it pick up those configurations. And so now this allows us to go up and down at the routing layer. So uh, let's take a look at some more numbers because numbers, 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 numbers are good. Uh, so if we look at the number of long-running containers that we have uh, for S3, we're running 5,800 containers, uh, about 500 C3, 4 XLs. Uh, so for the routing service, we're using the C3, 4 XLs. Um, Elasticsearch, there's about 850 uh, long-running containers. And the Kafka routing, we're at about 3,200 long-term containers. So in total, we're running about 10,000 containers for a routing service right now. Uh, in about 850-ish instances. All right, so let's drill down a little bit more. Container footprint, uh, about two to five gig in memory is average, uh, it's what we assign. Um, about one CPU share, uh, one to 12 partitions. So depending, we have topics that have only one partition, we have, so you may have a job with one partition. Uh, and then we periodically report health to, to the infrastructure. So if we look at averages, uh, about 1.8 gig per container. Average memory is between seven and 25 gig. CPU is only 8%, so we're not CPU bound. Uh, we're, actually, we, we're actually saturating network. Because the job of the routing service is consume as fast as you can and move it on. Right? Durability is there in case there's an issue, but the intent is to move it to its long-term location as fast as possible. So network in, 256, uh, network out, about 156. More numbers. Uh, so we write to S3 every 200 MB or two minutes, whichever comes first. Our average upload to S3 is about uh, 200 milliseconds. 
If we look at producer to router latency, 50, or 70th percentile is under a second, 90th to two seconds. Overall, we're averaging about two seconds. So from the point that, it produce, that an event is produced to the point that it goes to the router is two and a half seconds. And if we look at Kafka to router lag, uh, 90th percentile is about five seconds. How many folks here have used SAMSA? How many folks here that have used SAMSA are running it with Yarn? You don't have to anymore. Uh, so one of the trade-offs, once again, uh, when we decided to go with SAMSA, was it had a dependency that runs under Yarn. And we did not want to run and manage Yarn for a routing service. Uh, there's also a dependence, there's also p potential where you get split brain, and so it's not truly HA. And so once again, we wanted to minimize those things. So these JIRAs, uh, we're running this in production. We have a forked version. We've submitted fixes, uh, so we'll see what happens. But uh, SAMSA 41 basically is the one that allows us to run uh, in containers, so standalone. Um, the other one that was really big for us was uh, 775, uh, that one we were having uh, out of memory issues, the way it uh, does its prefetch buffer. So uh, we also submitted patches for those. For those who are SAMHSA users, uh, there is a meetup in, I think, the 13th next week. LinkedIn will be talking in a lot more detail about the routing service. So it'd be a good opportunity. And even if you guys aren't using SAMs that are interested in stream processing, uh, it's, uh, it's, I think it's 6.30 on uh, the 13th, so. Cool. So let's take a look at the Kafka piece, the Kafka to Kafka. So this is where we are doing a lot of our real time. It's similar to the previous branch, except kind of a little bit more simplified. So. Three typical areas, custom, Mantis, Spark, and I'll touch on them. Uh, so custom application could be anything. Uh, you write a service, consume off of Kafka, and off you go. Um, the retention period in these Kafka clusters vary based on needs. So while we want to minimize in the front team, these are up to different teams, develop, uh, development teams to decide what they need, what their needs are. So if we look at Mantis, uh, Mantis is an internal stream processing system that was developed uh, at Netflix. Uh, we recently open sourced Fenza, which is a part of that. Uh, but it does real-time or historical streams. Uh, it also has progressive processing. Um, it does push, pull, or mixture. So you could have a single job be configured to change based on stage. It's also cloud native, so both jobs and clusters have the ability to scale up and down. Spark streaming. Spark streaming users? All right, a couple. More SAMs than Spark streaming? Wow. Uh, so when we were evaluating our routing service, uh, we actually looked at Spark streaming as well. Uh, Spark within Netflix uh, has taken, is, is a little bit more along on the batch side. There are teams at Netflix that are using Spark Streaming uh, in this context that I showed, but it's not, it's still kind of a leaf system. Um, one of the things we looked at one, two, uh, performance numbers weren't quite there, back pressure. Uh, we worked, you know, we worked with the community, we worked with uh, Databricks on campaigning for back pressure work. Um, we did notice a significant increase in performance between what's one two and one three, so uh, so yeah. So we'll see where, where Spark Streaming goes. Uh, there seems to be a lot of at least internally, uh, especially folks that are using it in batch context, we're starting to see more and more requests for people that that are interested in being able to do things both in batch and real time. So Netflix is primarily Java shop. Uh, so if you have an application written in Java, this is how you would be able to send events to us. Uh, now, while it's mostly a Java shop, doesn't mean it's only a Java shop. 
So there are other things. So what we do is we also provide a proxy service. So if you have a Python application, uh, you can make a call and send us events. So our wire format. Uh, extensible currently support JSON only. Um, we are quickly going to pick up Avro support. Um, the interesting thing about this is, so when we started the process, we decided to try to make this as frictionless as possible. The intent is we wanted to be able to new pipeline, run in parallel with the old, and then be able to cut over, right? Because that's, how, how do you move 550 billion events without causing impact? One of the things we did there is, at the producer level, we made it so that we did dual writes. So we ended up shadowing traffic. And so we were able to have hot pipeline and the other one that we were building out, which was Keystone, run in parallel. The one thing we did is we decided to change wire format because it allowed us future flexibility. And this, so like kind of a pro tip, uh, this is one that the change caused a serialization bug. It affected a handful of teams, but it went from being fairly frictionless to us now having to work with them and have them pick up new versions and things of that sort. So, so it was a lot more effort that we could have probably avoided. So in hindsight, we should have probably held off on making this change until further down after we had cut over. Um, but that's just, it's one of those things where in hindsight, like I said, it's, you gotta figure out what you're optimizing for and, and we try to optimize not only for frictionless but also for future flexibility and we ended up introducing uh, an issue. So a couple of things we're doing at the producer level. Um, so our philosophy is that if our service is down, we should never stop what that instance is serving. We should not have any impact. The other thing is if our service is not available, we shouldn't keep other services, new instances from coming up. And when we are restored, it should automatically start sending events back. So, fail, but never block. Cool, so want to shift a little bit. I talked about some of the architecture pieces, some of the philosophies. I'm gonna shift a little bit in some of the monitoring and dashboarding that we're implementing. So this is one of the areas that you can never have enough. Um, and so we're spending a significant amount of time and effort making sure that we have the visibility that we need. So one of the things we've done, uh, so this is one of our dashboards. So you have the ability at a high level, 10,000 foot level, sit there and view what's going on. Quickly we can drill down from overall to brokers, to topics. So this is important for us to have that visibility, especially when you start talking about thousands of instances, hundred, hundreds upon hundreds of topics and, and billions of events. So we've spent a significant amount of time on these. There's still considerably more work to do, but it's critical that you have insights into what's going on. So for those who've used Kafka, uh, this is probably a familiar-ish concept. Uh, LinkedIn has, I, th I think they've done a talk on this. Uh, it's kind of an auditor type service. So we have our own, um, and basically what we do is we do broker monitoring, consumer monitoring, heart beating, uh, as well as testing. So on broker, we alert on offline from Zookeeper, consumer, any lags, uh, stuck or unconsumed partitions. Uh, as well as hard beating. The one thing that it does not do is it does not track uh, the flow of messages in the pipeline. So that's one area that we want to work on to be able to track messages as they go through the pipeline. Um, on the benchmarking, you're able to produce tens of thousands of messages, a single instance. Uh, we will be open sourcing this along with uh, a few other things here shortly. So. So here's some of the monitoring there. Um, as I mentioned, so this is broker. Consumer, you could see lag, stuck consumers, unconsumed partitions, uh, offsets. 
So, great. We see what's going on. We see something's not working. What's the typical way you, you deal with something? You get an alert. You look at it. You look at some graphs. You log in. Or you have some automation. So Winston is a new internal service that's been developed by one of the other platform teams. Uh, it's an automation engine. And so what Winston does, it collects diagnostic information, and then it acts on that. So the intent of Winston is to make things self-heal. There's a lot of times where you have very specific runbooks for how you resolve an issue, and people do it over and over and over. The intent here is to take the human part out of that. If Winston doesn't know what to do, then you get notified. Uh, so a couple keys here. It reduces mean time to recover. Once again, getting paged for something that you could have some service take care of for you, uh, and overall developer productivity. Uh, there is a meetup. So for folks that are interested in uh, automation remediation, we are hosting a meetup in November, mid-November for that as well. So if anyone's in the Bay Area. So this is a typical Winston uh, alert. So what happened here was a broker was reported to be offline. Winston took a look and said, cool, it's an unrunning state, but it's not there, so let's restart it. So no, no required zero interaction from us. As we mentioned about visualizations, this is kind of our start into this. So we wanted to have a way to be able to quickly visualize the health of our systems. So here's a view, uh, one of the regions, US East, of our clusters. So everything looks mostly green. You see one of them, uh, log trace, it's, it's starting to turn a little red. What this though allows us to do is to quickly look at it and drill down. So we could go from clusters to brokers and we could see what's going on, if there's any brokers that are having issues. And then we could drill down to topics. So this is a quick way for us to visualize what's happening in our systems. So if we look at near term, Right now, we haven't done a lot around performance tuning and optimizations. Uh, on the SAMHSA job uh, container piece, we think with proper bin packing, we could have significant improvements. Um, same thing on the Kafka side. So right now, we're looking at EBS. I think there was a CrowdStrike was the one who just did a talk on using uh, EBS back for Cassandra. Um, so we're looking at GP2. We've run some preliminary testing on it. And we actually had much better replication performance, less lag out of sync partitions than we do with the D2s. So that'll be something that we're gonna experiment over the next quarter to see what kind of performance gains we could gain there. So self-service. We showed some of the visualizations and one of the things that we as a team wanna do is we wanna remove ourselves from being critical path or blocking for developers. We want to provide tooling to allow our developers to do what they need to do. You need to create a topic, you're able to do that. You need to create new routing rules, you can do that yourself. So building self-service tools around what we have. Right now, it's still very much people requesting for us to do things. And that just, that's, that becomes a blocking thing. It's, we become a gating factor. Schemas and registries. We don't do schemas right now. Yeah, good look. Um, we've been talking about certain types of events, uh, being able to support schemas, uh, registering events. Once again, this kind of falls into the self-service piece. Uh, you go in, register event, provide your schema. The issue we want to try to solve is creating a contract between producers and consumers. Right now, we find ourselves in situations where someone will change something, and it breaks downstream and no one knows. So this is a big area that we'll be focusing on over the next quarter. Discovering visualization. So the one area that we have a pretty big gap 
is people knowing exactly what events are flowing through the system. It's critical now, but as we move even a little bit further on, when we start going more stream processing, this becomes more critical. So one of the things we want to focus on is how do I discover what's there? Right now, there's really no good way for people to take a step back and say, oh, okay, this event already exists, or we have this, so I could use this. So extending the work that we've done on visualizations, as well as adding a discovery service. We mentioned open sourcing, Auditor. Uh, that will be happening shortly. We're also going to be putting together a series of blog posts, uh, kind of digging into each of these areas a little bit deeper so that best practices, instance types, performance numbers. So look out for those. We'll be doing that over the next, next month or so as well. Long term. So over the next 12 months, one of the things that we're looking at doing is moving more towards a uh, real-time data stream and stream processing network. So what does that mean? Right now, there's starting to be a lot, and more, a lot more desire around Kafka. And so what we're looking at doing is how do we offer a general messaging service that's multi-tenant, handles queues, streams, notifications, um, same thing on the stream processing side. We want a general purpose multi-tenant stream processing system that enables people to do things like joins, filters, any of their ETL work, normalization, whatever the case may be, over multiple data, data sets. If you look at Keystone, Keystone really is just a product that's built on top of these services, right? So right now, it's a paved path but the paved path's kind of limited as far as where you can send things. People may not want to produce an event and have it go to S3, or they may want to just Elasticsearch, or they may want to do point-to-point -point communication. And so what we're looking at evolving into is more of providing those underlying services with Keystone being a product that's built on top of those. On the stream processing, that's actually one area that's a little bit fuzzier in the sense that there's a lot of competing technologies out there. Uh, one of the challenges that we have is how do we have something that's able to handle six and a half million events per second, consume them and do something with it? The other is, this goes back to the visualization and discovery. If I take an event and I enrich it and I republish it within the pipeline, how do I discover that it's there? Someone may have already done a transformation for something that's critical, and I don't have to do that now. So that's some of the areas that we're looking at over the next, I'd say, six to 12 months, is evolving more into more general purpose messaging and stream processing.